let me go right into the program here and introduce the, I believe he prefers to be called the mastermind of the program, the creator and composer, Andrew List. <laughs> On the Wing is a celebration of birds and music and poetry, so poetry is a, an important part of it, so we'd like to welcome our poet, Mary Pennard. And Mary wrote lyrics for the, the music that Andrew has created, as well as the poetry. And to perform some of those lyrics, our wonderful vocalist is mezzo-soprano Krista River. And uh, our pianist, I haven't even spoken to him tonight because he's been going, getting scores, I understand, or finding scores that are have gone astray this evening. He's been out there in the snow for several hours, but he still looks great. George Lopez. <laughs> and then a man who likes to say that he really doesn't know much about music, but he knows everything about the music of birds. Please welcome Wayne Peterson. <laughs> On the wing. summer afternoon, everything still a stone. Even the cheering cicadas were mute. I was sitting in the shade, taking sanctuary from the heat, when I saw him land at the bird bath. In the lazy haze, a shock of red and that square black mask. I'd seen him many times before, feeding in the grass or singing medleys on a wire, thought I knew what to expect beauty in bold contrasts. But this was something else altogether. His quick step through the watery mirror, then flap, plash, a fabulous effervescence, wings like jeweled fans opening a spectrum of hues, from crimson and wine to violet and pink, then magenta, auburn, and carnelian too. This rainbow of reds, oasis in June. Crow, expert town crier, I am guard extraordinaire. Nothing, no thing gets by me without note. Sure, raconteur, I am wise to all, ever certain. Pileated woodpecker, throwback. Wild laugher, I tear the veil of morning vi mist with a raucous repertoire and shake down the silence with my skull-cracking carpentry. You can trace my famous appetite in the oblong holes I dig in trees. Even my tongue has old tricks in store. It's sticky and extensible to find ants and ants and ants galore. My high hat red crest looks arch and royal from afar, and if late last week you hadn't spotted me with my toes zygodactyl, you'd have thought I were a lone pterodactyl. <laughs> Duck family. Given their beauty and various traits, geese and swans are members too. The guest list for an affair of ducks would reach as far as Timbuktu. There'd be wood ducks and whistlers, shovelers and teal, the hooded mergansers, pintails and scops, add old squaws, buffleheads, harlequins, blacks, plush golden eyes, scoters, mallards, and masked. There'd have to be room for the elegant swans, tundra, trumpeter, whooper, and mute, and oodles of land for the subfamily goose, blue, barnacle, cackling in snow, Ross's Egyptian, and emperor, emperor, phew. So fill up the rivers, call in the seas, then stock up on tadpoles and mollusks and weeds. Arctic tern. 
Despite the winter in my name, I am of all birds most touched by the sun. Flying as far and as far again as I do, from the North Pole to the South, over the great patchwork of Earth's meridians, every year the warmth of two summers is mine. Daylight is my second set of wings. How else could I span time zones and oceans, all those weathered worlds? I am steadfast in my will to fly, wheeling and soaring, and holding to in wind with time, endless vapor trail passing me quietly by. I am here. 
out nearby. Or clap and wing me, scaring them off. Before I move in, tip an egg out to make a place for my own. Leaving it to be raised by another. Some call me lazy bird, even cuckold. But who can judge me? It's uh, my pleasure, obviously, to be surrounded by some very talented people here this evening. And as was suggested, I am not musically inclined. Um, cultural dwarfism is sort of my byline. But I do know something about birds. And when uh, the opportunity presented itself to come up with an umbrella theme for this presentation that features all manner of um, good things related to birds, it struck me that bird migration would be something that would be very appropriate for um, a program that sort of dealt with birds on a, on a grand theme. And I think it's appropriate also that if, if we believe in um, whatever, this snow is not going to be here forever, and that within the, the foreseeable future, there are going to be movements and signs of life, and ultimately there's going to be millions of birds uh, coming our way. One of the things about birds that is sort of uh, transcends all, all manner of species is the fact that a great many of them travel uh, long distances on an annual basis. And if one looks at this uh, graphic here, one gets the sense that there are birds coming and going uh, throughout the Western Hemisphere um, in all directions, and some of them long distance travelers, some of them short distance travelers, but in all cases, um, travelers. So to this end, I think it's important to sort of think about who the travelers are. And in some cases, uh, there's whole groups. We heard one of Mary's poems talk about waterfowl and ducks. Clearly, waterfowl are one of the, the groups that occur in spectacular abundance and have long been popular with, with both sportsmen as well as uh, poets and writers and so forth. So these snow geese, and the sandhill cranes and so forth in the foreground are all sort of representative of that group. Um, raptors, birds of prey, are some of our more spectacular migrants. Um, this is something that in hawk watching parlance is called a kettle. Uh, these are broad winged hawks. This is a species that actually has a very narrow telescoped migration, particularly in the autumn when usually within about a week or 10 days window in mid-September, it's possible at certain key localities to see literally thousands of these birds wheeling and soaring on their way to South America where they spend the winter. At this time of the year, there are stirrings uh, in the Andes and in Peru where these birds are beginning to think about making a northward migration that will eventually bring them back to our part of the world. Shorebirds, arguably among the, the greatest globetrotters of all, um, species with which many people affiliated with the Goldenrod Foundation certainly have um, uh, a touch point because Plymouth Beach and Duxbury Beach right here in the South Shore are two areas that host literally thousands of, of migrating sandpipers and plovers during the, the autumn migration primarily, but in some cases even the spring, so that uh, in this group we can, we can pick out individual species that are among the most spectacular migrants of all. And then ultimately, if we, if we believe spring will come, May will arrive, and we'll, we'll see a, a plethora of, of warblers, which for probably many people represent the zenith of their birding year because of their color and their, their, not their songs, they really don't warble very much, but they're challenging. So for people who like biological puzzles, warblers are, are certainly a favorite. So when we look at this galaxy of species here, we see such spectaculars as the black-throated green warbler, the chestnut-sided warbler in the lower left, the black-throated blue warbler, the Nashville warbler. They have wonderful names as well. So I think the real question is, why do birds migrate? And this is something that uh, has puzzled biologists and ornithologists for years. 
And there are many reasons. Um, a lot of these are sort of bulleted here. There are others. And arguably, one of the, the great mystical parts of this whole phenomenon is we probably really don't know um, all the facts and, and so forth. But I think this gives you a sense of um, what's involved. And I think if you can fathom the fact that migration is something that evolved over the millennia, what we see recapitulated on an annual basis today between summer and winter is something that was actually driven over many, many hundreds of thousands, millions of years in terms of climate change, glacial periods, interglacial periods, warming trends when birds were responding to changing food supplies because ultimately food is one of the great drivers in terms of avian survival and much of what we see in migration today is a function of response to changes in food uh, now on an annual basis. It's an interesting phenomenon, I think, that many birds migrate at night. A lot of people don't think about this. They sort of suddenly wake up one morning and, and there's a, uh, a bird singing outside their window that they haven't heard for how many months. Uh, but in point of fact, um, a great many bird species, most of the small songbirds, what we call passerine species, in fact, are uh, nocturnal migrants. And accordingly, um, they encounter all manner of, of conditions and problems and, and sort of uh, raise theoretical questions that may not on the surface be obvious. But if you think about um, the issue of, of, you know, why they do this and some of the factors that are at play, um, it, it's very interesting to think about, among other things, how do they manage to, to find their way? Well, certainly at night, um, stars and the celestial patterns represent a, a, a possible source. Um, but there are other things that also uh, are at play in terms of thinking about um, what in fact is, is going to trigger migration, not just in terms of the, the millennial uh, window, but, but actually some of these things that are um, present today that, that birds can take advantage of. So if you sort of think again about this bulleted list and, and anticipate some of the factors at play, stars have been demonstrated in very elegant and sophisticated planetarium studies that birds are using, using star patterns as a way to help them navigate. Um, some fancy um, and, and sort of creative little devices called Emlin uh, cups, which were funnels with white paper set in a, in a, in a, a funnel-like device with an ink pad on the bottom and covered with hardware cloth, put white-throated sparrows out at night at appropriate seasons and look at the way the sparrows will flutter from the ink pad in terms of their preferred direction to go. And this was one of the things that actually began to give people evidence that in the real world, stars were important and that birds were taking advantage of the, the, set, the heavens because when those same Emlin cages were brought indoors and in a planetarium environment, you could change the celestial configuration. You could get birds trying to move in a southerly direction when in fact they should have been going north or the flip side uh, at the opposite season of the year. Pretty good evidence that stars were clearly one of the things that were very important. And on overcast nights, uh, oftentimes there is either less migration, as is able to be tracked by things like radar and so forth, or there can be disorientation when birds lose the benefit of that compass. But there are other things. Magnetic fields, for example, are things that now have been demonstrated initially with pigeons, that there's magnetite in the brain of many bird species that actually allows them to take advantage of the Earth's magnetic fields as grids that will give them some sense of fundamental direction. There are leading lines that birds can see even at night. Um, I mentioned first the, the broadwing hawk and its spectacular diurnal migration. They take advantage of leading lines like the Appalachians. They work their way down the Appalachians all the way down through Texas and then into Mexico. They spill out through um, Panama and then funnel out into their wintering quarters in, in uh, northern South America. But they're taking advantage of leading lines that, that are landform configurations. Similarly, coastlines for many water birds are obviously very important in terms of uh, um, how they find their way and the sorts of things that they utilize. And it's very possible that even today, with our uh, interstate highways, many of which are illuminated either because of lights that are deliberately put there or just traffic, that birds may gradually figure out, oh yeah, this is going my way. I'm going to just follow these lights. I'm going to follow this highway. 
Um, seabirds are actually able to use olfaction as a way to find their way over trackless ocean uh, areas where there are no land features, there are no leading lines, there are no lights. Yes, there's stars, but in terms of not only migration but also foraging for food, it's been determined that many seabirds, um, like this Cory Shearwater, actually can smell. They have uh, well um, formed olfactory lobes in their head, they have tubes on their noses, and there's all sorts of evidence to suggest that they can pick up odors very keenly over vast stretches of, of water. So what are some of the things that initiate migration? Well, there's, there's a lot of things. There are um, big picture things that uh, involve the hormonal changes that are a function of changing day length. Um, there are changes in food availability, um, particularly in the autumn migration for birds departing as food becomes less and less available, especially for those species that feed largely on arthropods and insects the things that seasonally begin to disappear in the fall and winter. Um, there are things that are also happening on a more immediate basis that stimulates birds to migrate. In other words, the question is, well, why do birds, why, do they, why are they going to migrate tonight, or why did they migrate yesterday, or why are they going to wait till tomorrow? A lot of this has to do with immediate factors in terms of temperature, um, increases in temperature, decrease in temperature, changes in the wind, barometric pressure, Birds are very sensitive, cre sensitive creatures. This is one of the reasons, of course, that they are often considered a litmus for all manner of phenomenon taking place in our environment. But at this time of the year, dare I say in another two months, um, when we have a sudden rise in temperature and a, a warm front coming from the south, this is a trigger. This is the thing that says we're going to migrate tonight. But if it starts to rain, or if the overcast closes in, or if the wind shifts, or we get a cold front, that's the sort of dam that keeps birds from migrating that night and may also put them down, remembering that most of them are, are typically nocturnal migrants. So there's a whole host of things that trigger when and how and, and so forth and so on. So how far do they go on any given evening, or perhaps even in the, in the course of a migration? How high do they fly? What speed did they travel? Well, again, technology is increasingly our friend here because it's now possible using all manner of, of, of technology to sort of measure rather precisely in some cases exactly how high migrants are flying, how fast they may be moving, um, and how far they're going to go. Um, again, depending upon the, the nature of the research and the nature of the, the, the study, it's possible to get all kinds of stuff um, from, from what birds are giving us now. Even wind tunnels, this house finch that's flying in a wind chamber here, uh, gives us some sense in terms of how birds behave when they're flying uh, above the earth. And a lot of them are not flying necessarily all that high. Oftentimes they're within a couple of thousand feet. You know, if you think about your, your last trip to Florida or wherever you went, you know, the pilot eventually comes on and says, our cruising altitude will be 32. 34,000 feet, we're going to have to go up a little bit, we've got some bumpy weather ahead. And that's not, you know, that, for a little bird, that's not all that easy. But there are some creatures that can do very well. Um, these bar-headed geese, for example, are capable of flying annually twice over Mount Everest in the Himalayas, so that they can really sky, as it were, and, and go much higher, uh, for example, than uh, many of the songbirds and things that we typically associate with uh, bird migration around here. And we have good indication that a lot of the shorebirds, for example, are similarly able to fly at very, very high elevations and often at considerable speed. Um, back in the 60s and 70s, some of the early radar work that was done in, in eastern Canada was tracking shorebirds leaving James Bay in, in northern Ontario. They were headed nonstop, in fact, for South America. And by the time they reached um, the coast, they were approaching 15 and 20,000 feet. Many of them, Hudsonian godwits, for example, red knots, these birds were traveling at speeds that were approaching 50 miles an hour or more with a tailwind, taking advantage of the geography of the Atlantic coast, setting a course that would take them out over the ocean that would allow them to then pick up the trade winds at an appropriate point that would gradually def deflect them back to South America. So. These birds know what they're doing, they've figured it out, and they have certainly come up with strategies, if you take the long list, 
that, that covers the board in terms of, of how they do business. There's a lot of different ways to sort of think about migration in terms of migration type. Some birds are, are short distance migrants, some don't migrate at all. Downy woodpeckers, things like that. Cardinals hardly move around very much, a lot of birds that we're familiar with. But there are other birds that um, we think of as being permanent residents in Massachusetts, but in fact, the residents that are here are not necessarily permanent. Chickadees, if you go to the Manomet Center for Conservation Sciences and look at their data set that goes back to 1969, there are massive chickadee years. Um, there can be huge years for um, blue jays, for example. Blue jays periodically have, have, have big years and, and lesser years. Crows are surprisingly migratory. If you go to some of these hawk watching sites in central and western Massachusetts in October and early November, hundreds of crows moving south. So yes, we have crows here year round, but they're not all the same crows. And the chickadees that you see at your yard, at your feeder at this time of the year, may not very well be the chickadees that you have nesting nearby in the summer. So we have these sort of partial migrants. We have some species that are eruptive. Many of you may have heard last year that we had a massive snowy owl uh, eruption. These are arctic breeding birds of prey that, that are driven largely by changes in, in food supply, principally in the form of a little arctic rodent called the lemming. And these lemmings are cyclical in their abundance, uh, not only in a region, but also east to west, west to east, so that in years when there are lots and lots of lemmings produced, snowy owls breed like crazy, they're able to generate more young, so that by the time winter sets in, there's a lot more snowy owls around than there are lemmings, so these snowy owls begin to emigrate out of the Arctic, and in huge years, like this past winter, we get to enjoy them here. Other years, we may just see a, a, a very few. There's plenty of food in the Arctic, there aren't as many snowy owls, and, and they're perfectly capable of, of staying at home. Um, in the case of some of these birds that um, have what we call a differential migration, um, the adults and the young, or maybe the males and the females, may have a slightly different strategy for, for how they uh, get about. So in the case of the herring gull, for example, if you were to go out and systematically look at flocks of herring gulls at this time of the year, there would be a significant preponderance of adults, or birds that were older than younger. But if you were to go down into the mid-Atlantic states, or the Gulf states along the coast, there'd be lots of young herring gulls. In other words, our herring gulls that may have been bred right here in New England or Massachusetts, the young of the year go considerably farther south than, than do the adults. And blue jays, one of the things that's interesting about blue jays, they're tracking acorns. So that when blue jays begin to move south in the fall, if we have a bumper crop of acorns produced here, a lot of our blue jays will shortstop and stay here for the winter. Christmas bird count data tells us this, and in years when there's a dearth of acorns, when you don't walk out in your driveway and you don't feel like you're walking on marbles, uh, oftentimes the blue jay numbers are considerably lower, but again, if you look at the Christmas bird count data, we find that there may be a lot of blue jays, uh, again, in the mid-Atlantic states or even in the southeastern states, because they've gone that much farther, where there's a superabundance of food seasonally. In addition to birds like raptors, like the snowy owl, and I could throw in the rough-legged hawk or the northern shrike, there are songbirds that are also eruptive. Uh, common red poles, pine siskins, crossbills, red and white-winged crossbills, these are cone mongers. They follow the cyclical production of spruce and fir cones in the boreal forest. And in the same way that acorns and various other mast crops are produced on an irregular basis through the years. Uh, so too are things like catkins and the seeds that these guys feed on. So when there's an abundance of catkins, we don't see very many red poles and pine siskins. But when there's a failure of those food crops in the boreal forest, we often get what we call an incursion in the winter, and everybody's all excited because their thistle feeders are running down every day because they've got these little finches uh, taking advantage of it. Now there are some birds that are really superstars in the migration world and they're not all water birds, they're not all shore birds, they're not all raptors. The bobolink, the familiar bobolink, which sadly has another story in terms of decline as a function of declining agriculture, but this is the the longest distance songbird migrant uh, in North America. These guys winter in the pampas of Argentina and Bolivia and they're, you know, they're about the size of the clicker in my hand or only a little larger. They go a long way. 
so that this is one that uh, if you wanted to come up with a Scrabble word, what's the longest distance migrating songbird in North America? Say bobolink and you'll be, uh, you'll be a winner for sure. But if you want to go marathon uh, distance, then we talk about things like the Arctic Turn. It was one of the poems that was, was read and, and we know a little bit about the Arctic Turn. The Wilson Storm Petrel, uh, for example, most of you don't know that it arguably is the most abundant bird species in the world. But these two guys are, are literally going from hemisphere to hemisphere, practically from Arctic to um, subarctic. That is to say, the Arctic Turn, by virtue of its name, many of them breed inside and north of the Arctic Circle, and most of them winter in Antarctica. Wilson storm petrels, uh, they march to their own drum, they breed in the sub-Antarctic islands, and they migrate north into the western North Atlantic for their winter. That would be the austral uh, season, but for us it's our summertime. So some of these seabirds are particularly spectacular. If we think about um, warblers, again, a, a group that's diverse, that, that includes lots of different species, um, they don't all take the same route. Um, this map gives you some sense of the variations between some that take sort of offshore routes, some that take a conservative route down the east coast through peninsula Florida into the, 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 the greater Antilles uh, and the West Indies for the winter. Some go the sort of chicken route and go around the Gulf of Mexico. Some go right across the Gulf of Mexico. So it's interesting to track these, these different uh, bird species even within the same very closely related group. So if you start putting all these together, again, think back to that first big map that I showed you. You have birds coming and going in all directions and using all different routes. Birders, bird watchers, have been key in terms of helping us establish a lot of what we know about migration, and there are lots of citizen science efforts that have contributed information. Curiously, some of the early studies involved literally moon watching. Uh, an ornithologist by the name of George Lowry at the University of, of LSU, Louisiana State University, was the first to pioneer the technique of moon watching. So on a full moon evening, if you want to sit outside with binoculars or a scope, you can see birds crossing the moon. And as you get to areas where migration is particularly heavy, you can get some sense as to the, the volume of migration, and in some cases, the directionality, and to a certain extent, in some cases, even generally what kind of birds may be involved. Banding, Audubon, John James, that would be, uh, was the first to fiddle around with putting um, something around the legs of Phoebes to find out if they came back, and in fact they did. And from that genesis moving forward, bird banding is now a time-honored technique where it's possible to capture birds without hurting them and place small aluminum bands, in some cases color bands, on their legs, each of which is individually identified numerically and which allows somebody else who may find that bird either dead or capture it um, and, and take that little band, record the information, send it to the address at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that's provided, and eventually the loop is closed and we find out not only do we know where the bird was marked, but we also know where it, it was recaptured. And this is a technique that's been ongoing and now hundreds of thousands of birds are banded or have been banded and continue to be banded every year. Another study that's uh, opened up in recent years increasingly is the use of radar. Uh, birds are detectable on radar the same way that aircraft and, and various other objects in space can be detected. Um, this image basically gives you a look at a huge migrant swarm leaving Cuba uh, and arriving at Key West, uh, Florida. And this kind of technique of using radar as a way to anticipate, track, and, and sort of monitor bird migration is something that now is very sophisticated. And with the, the observers on the ground, like the birders, for example, that can sort of tell you the morning after the, the night before, okay, we know that there was a heavy migration. Now we're going to tell you what kind of stuff was moving because we can see it on the ground. So this is another technique that, that has worked very effectively. Increasingly now, um, the, the, the technology has become that much more sophisticated. Um, this gentleman is, is Rob Beauregard. He's a professor at the University of North Carolina and has been studying ospreys using satellite transmitters for many years. And with his efforts, it's been possible to literally track 
on practically a daily basis the movement of ospreys that were banded uh, here in New England or the Northeast as they make their way down to their wintering grounds, in most cases somewhere in northern South America. And you can see in this, this graphic that there are three different lines here that are basically represent three different ospreys and their routes to their wintering grounds. Geolocators are another device that increasingly are becoming more popular where they can actually, the, the device is able to read sunset and sunrise and yet then using very elaborate tables it's possible to figure out where that bird was for the entire time that it had the geolocator on. The downside is you have to catch the bird again after you put it on, unlike a satellite transmitter. But these are all technologies that are coming into play. All right, with all this sophistication, there are still hazards. The one thing that we can't do for birds is keep them out of harm's way. And there are a great many things that, that in fact do pose problems for birds. And along with some of the other sort of land-based issues that are facing birds in terms of habitat loss, degradation, competition with, with non-native species, pollution, et cetera, et cetera, um, light is one of the things that is a, is a big factor. And historically, there have been some massive um, kills at things like lighthouses and even tall buildings, cities, for example. Boston, our own beloved Beantown, has a lights out program where a lot of the tallest buildings are now turning out their upper tiers of lights during migration seasons, not only as an energy saving uh, effort, but also to diminish the, the harm to migratory birds that can get into trouble the same way that uh, historically they often did at towers and lighthouses. I hate to throw this in here because I'm sure everybody in this room loves cats. Probably half of you have one. A lot of them let them out the back door. My best advice to you is for the benefit of your cat to say nothing of birds, please don't do that. It's been, it's been demonstrated now that the, the millions and millions of birds that are killed by cats and other uh, camp following predators that, that inhabit human locations, skunks, possums, raccoons, anything that nests near the ground or is reachable by a tree climbing mammal is potentially fair game. And even if you put your cat out the front door and you got feeders in the back, don't think the cat doesn't go into the backyard. It does, I'm sorry, okay? So I will stop here and tell you that if and when we can ever get out of this driveway, and if we're patient, um, this snow will go away and that spring will come and the birds will come back. Thank you. <laughs>
More than any other bird, you've had political opportunity to digress with presidents. White House pet to Jefferson, Hayes, Cleveland, and Coolidge. What all did you overhear back in the days? Louisiana Purchase, Reconstruction, Railroad Strikes, Frugality? O oh, master of mimicry, mimus polyglottus, amorous yet monogamous, your finely tuned repertoire makes you nature's most lyrical copyist. Did they keep you in a cage or let you fly free down the carpeted hallways of history? How did you ever make songs from all that you heard there? What is the melody of politics, the ways of a nation, complex and fair? Maybe you were just a pet, songster, beloved for your melodious ways. Master of mimicry, mimus polyglottus, amorous yet monogamous, you are a chorus and your many melodies abide, O copyist most glorious. Sandhill Cranes. Once across a spring prairie, I saw a lilting, great feathered stilts leaping, two sandhill cranes in a love dance. It made me smile, gave me a memory of a lost love, uplift and kiss my once easy heart. Barn Owl, is it your silent stealth by night? How delicate serrations on your feathers muffle your flight? Is it where you nest, barn, cave, belfry, mine, as long as it's secluded, far from trespassing guests? Or is it your heart-shaped face, white, rough, lined with gold, with eyes, soulful, human-like in place? What is it that makes you seem so ghostly, wise? Thank you.
we'll uh, ask Andrew. You know, Andrew Wayne talked about what triggered migration, so we'll ask you what triggered you to rise up and create on the wing. I'll hand you this mic. Well, it was always a dream of mine to do something, a song cycle and a project on birds. I think at times of sorrow or loneliness, nature and birds have always been there to help me. And I feel very spiritually connected to them. And I must have been a bird in a past life or something like that. But seriously. Um, and I was in search of the right poet in the right time. And it actually took a little while. And I looked at bird poems. And I actually emailed Mary Oliver, who said, no, I don't. My, music, my bird poems are not, don't need music, which is basically true. And they're quite fabulous. And um, I knew Krista, and I really wanted to work with Krista. And I went to her concert, and Mary Pinard was reading. And immediately, I knew this was the lady. And she was very wonderful about it and said that she would do it. And we worked very hard together and did a lot of study. Uh, George Lopez and I have been working together for a number of years. And I always wanted to work with Krista River, one of our top sopranos in Boston and anywhere you could be. And we approached Wayne Peterson from Mass Audubon, and it was a go. So this is our second year, actually. February is kind of our anniversary of our group, and we asked Ray Brown to be part now, so uh, here we are. Who else would like to try this microphone? I'm going to hold on to it, but a question. Yes, Phil. I just want to know what you've learned about birds uh, over the period of time that you've worked on this performance. Well, I, I will say I learned a lot about birds, uh, and I think I, I came to this project with a love of birds already, um, so I was delighted to be invited to have an adventure with a composer. But I think as I began to work on the poems, I learned more about the craft of poetry and the way in which it sometimes serves well music, but sometimes needs to pull back a little bit to save room for music. So I learned to make poems that created space for not only the, the music, but the, but the singer. So I learned about my own craft, but I also took it seriously in the sense that um, I didn't want to just um, craft poems that were stereo stereotypes of birds. I wanted to learn very particular things about birds. So for example, in the case of the Northern Mockingbird, who I always admired for its incredible singing skills and mimicry, um, I discovered in research that presidents also admired mockingbirds and had them as pets in the White House. So, so I wanted very much to have the poems be um, true to the birds, but also move in a direction that perhaps um, created some new uh, awareness for people who are hearing about the birds for the first or second or tenth time. So I learned a lot in a lot of different directions, and I don't know if somebody else wants to. Sure. I mean, I'll just add that um, I was definitely not a birder, and I'm still not a birder. I'm sorry to say, but yes, they're they're working on me. Um, but uh, so I've actually I've learned an awful lot, both through Mary's poetry and also through uh, listening to Wayne speak about um, migration and other subjects. I've heard him talk about. So um, so it's actually it's been very uh, educational for me. What did you learn about birds, Wayne? <laughs> <laughs> well, as something of an outlier um, in terms of this, this group, uh, my colleagues, it's been, I probably have had, I won't say the steepest learning curve, but I've had more enjoyment perhaps than any of the others in that um, the various mediums, including poetry and music and, and piano and so forth, these are things that are sort of off my radar screen and not squarely on my grid. And accordingly, it's, uh, it's been fascinating not only to sort of engage myself in that level of thinking about birds and so forth, but I think almost as interesting to me is the extraordinary interest on the part of the various audiences that we've been privileged to speak in front of. The numbers of people that have, have come the questions that we've had, the obvious enthusiasm and appreciation for the various talents in our group, I think to me have been almost as impressive as, as, um, as anything. But certainly the, the fact that, that I've been sort of drawn into disciplines that were never, as I said, uh, foremost in, in, in my screen, I think has for me been, been a real highlight of, of the effort. 
So the northern, northern Mockingbird, the first bird to be in the presidential cabinet. <laughs> Not as a member, but anyway. <laughs> Another question. Um, how are the choices made to select the birds that were spoken about and sung about tonight? Mary and I really conceived of On the Wing as a project together. We met a number of times. I had an outline, a little outline, but we wanted to do backyard birds, shorebirds, um, birds of prey, and also vanishing species was always an important part of the topic because I think that On the Wing celebrates birds but also helps bring people into the awareness that stewardship of our natural world is, is as important as the enjoyment and if you love something you have to take care of it. So um, Mary always had this thing where even when she listed the birds it's never too late, right Mary? You would say, I mean, even though the last one is kind of s a little sad and it was placed very on purpose there so that people would think about what it is that we're talking about but things are turning around. I mean, the good old cowbird is doing really well, right? <laughs> um, but we, we spent a lot of time working on it. So that was kind of our thing. And we wanted it to be fun. We wanted it to be upbeat. We wanted things to be poignant. And uh, originally, it was going to be 20 songs or 21 songs, which would have been a feat for one singer. Um, and luckily, Mary gets to read those other poems, which is quite wonderful. No, usually you hear that phrase, good old cowbird, <laughs> somehow. <but> uh, <laughs> Another question. Yeah, Andrew, it seemed to me that um, the various songs were uh, almost a celebration of the individuality of each of those birds. And then you left us with a very cautionary tale in Still Our Skies Are Left. I think that's what it's called. I just want to understand your thought process on, on how that evolved. I feel very, very, very fortunate that I met Mary Pennard. I admire her as an artist, and I think she's a supreme artist and performer, but also as a wonderful person. And I, as a composer, I couldn't have been more happy to be able to find a medium of those words that really brought the music forward. I mean, as artists, you know, it, it's, it's not the same as being a plumber. You go and you put the pipes together, and even if you're designing a building, but this, these things come from a very deep place, a very deep place, and, um, and oftentimes in flights of inspiration, and it's very spiritual in that way. So the poems themselves really gave me the music. I would say that each one is kind of a character study. Just the way they're, they're the personality of the bird, they're funny things, they're sad things, they're pointy things. But it was, it was Mary helped me make it happen, basically. And uh, there are actually two poems that are about vanishing species. One of them is Parrot. Don't forget about Parrot. Mm -hmm. And we went, Frank, uh, my partner and I went to, was in Philadelphia, and we saw these incredible pe works of art from the islands made of parrot's feathers and robes and all these things. I mean, when she talks about that, that's, that's like the real thing. And, um, and still our skies are left, really, it just kind of came out, you know. I had a lot of poems, I couldn't do them all. The ones that spoke to me were the ones that I did. And, um, but that one is a pretty interesting poem, pretty wonderful. So. Does that answer your question? I have a question for you, Wayne. Yes. The birds that can fly as high, the geese that can fly as high as the uh, Mount Everest, do they have a different or, or a system for breathing? None of us could fly that high without oxygen. How high can you fly, Trump? <laughs> oh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> you got me on that one, Ray. <laughs> That was going to be my question. <laughs> well, I'm not an avian physiologist. Um, however, I think it is fair to say that there are not a lot of birds that could do that. So obviously, there is some level of extreme physiological capability that allows them to do that sort of thing um, in the same way that certain diving creatures can dive much deeper than others. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they obviously have, have both anatomical and physiological adaptations. But specifically what those are, it's hard for me to, to say. But I dare say that, that there are probably avian physiologists who could give you some insights into that. But I do think 
it's true that not all birds could, could do it, and that's why not a lot of them do. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that's the best answer. But while I never lose an opportunity when you have the microphone, yeah. <laughs> but I wanted, I wanted to, there was something, a question that came out a minute ago, and, and I thought that there was a thread there as far as, you know, declining species and so forth and so on. There are lots of opportunities for people uh, to participate in various types of activities and events that will contribute information that may help turn around some of the declines that sadly have been documented. Um, and to Dory Stoley's credit, the Goldenrod Foundation and some of the programming that's done through that organization, for example, does give um, people who may not have had as much uh, experience or knowledge about some of the things that that uh, organization sponsors, that's one way that they can sort of be put in front of real life natural history. Um, certainly as an agent of Mass Audubon, we have all manner of programs and events and sanctuaries and things that allow um, the public to participate um, through citizen science, the, the doorway that we call citizen science. There's all sorts of activities and opportunities. You know, a visitation of websites to organizations like uh, the Goldenrod Foundation, like Mass Audubon, like the Manimate Center for Conservation Sciences just down the road. A lot of these, these organizations actually do afford opportunities for people to engage in projects that will contribute information that ultimately leads to uh, the kind of important and intelligent decision making that, that may lead to the protection and preservation of birds. And something that I didn't mention in my presentation, but I think needs to be the wallpaper um, not only in this room, but in, in, in everything we think about biological these days is climate change. This is, this is something that we really need to pay attention to. And there's unequivocal evidence that it is affecting birds. A lot of the northward expansion of southern species into New England and points north is certainly an indication of, of this. Um, rising sea level uh, is a threat to birds like the salt marsh sparrow, um, as well as uh, a lot of the coastal nesting birds. Uh, increase in, in sea uh, water temperatures are affecting fisheries, which translates to, in some cases, issues for nesting birds. There was a, a big problem two years ago and for the last couple of years in the Gulf of Maine with Atlantic puffins, a bird we all know and love as a function of, of uh, changes in fish population. So, you know, anything that people can do, potentially there are opportunities out there, and it's to your advantage to... Um, find out from, from uh, you know, opportunities online or from talking to people like Dory or myself, um, you know, some of the things that you might do. Um, with Anne-Marie Runfola in the audience here as an agent of Stellwagen and Bank National Marine Sanctuary, there's a monitoring program there that, that involves volunteers in terms of, of seabird work. So I think it's important that it, it, as we celebrate birds through these various wonderful media tonight that we also think about the fact that there's ways that, that people can make a difference. You don't have to just be an observer or, or somebody sitting there hearing about these things. Thank you, Wayne. Beautifully said. One more question? A question for me. As a guy who talks a lot. I'm glad you don't take the microphone in that case. I can make up any answer that I want. As a guy who talks a lot about birds, what do you take away from this, these performances? Well, I always think about, as I was mentioning before, about the confluence of music and birds and just thinking about how musical birds really are. And, and when you hear this, I think it reminds you of that. Um, you know, it's, it's often been said that birds were the first composers, and, and they, really, they really were. And, and the fact that they influenced so many composers like Beethoven and Mozart and, and Andrew Liszt and, and many others, um, and Olivier Messiaen, some of you know that composer who, who wrote, oh, I know Andrew knows, knows his, his work well, wrote so many pieces about birds, literal translations of bird song, and then uh, in figurative and imaginative translations of, of bird song. So um, I wish I knew bird songs the way Wayne does. Mm -hmm. I'd appreciate it that much more, but uh, that's what I think I really I come away with. Anybody else going once? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. This was inspiring. And I can't help but think, wouldn't it be wonderful to have an educational kind of kit or something to take to schools or 
other places to families. Has, have you discussed that? I know you've got day jobs and other things going on as well, but um, to be able to take this even farther, is that something that's... Definitely. We were interested in community outreach, going to schools, doing the, pre doing the presentation for children. We had children. We, um, at the, at, um, the Addison Gallery of American Art, we had a really great concert there in the gallery, which was really fun. Wayne did a talk on snowy owls and surprised everybody with the stuffed snowy owl. And there were a lot of kids in the audience who really sat through it. Um, I know one little young man named AJ, who's 12 years old, and he really enjoyed the show. And other components of maybe using artwork or having field trips that are connected to it, bird watching for children, ways of getting kids involved. So, and not only kids, we're gonna be doing this hopefully at North Hill and Senior Center, people who love birds. Um, we have other plans and are very interested in expanding and you know, broadening our, our world with this. A round of applause again for our wonderful performance. <laughs> On the way.